Would you mind just raising your hand um, if you've ever moved from a, from a house into an apartment? How did that go? <laughs> exactly, right? You got way too much stuff, am I right? That happened to us when we, when I graduated from school, uh, studying to be a pastor, seminary school, uh, my first call, my first assignment was to start a church in New York City, and we moved there then from the Midwest to, to Queens. And we were so excited, it was awesome, we, we, it was just, it was a perfect situation for us, but it was a big adjustment, as you can imagine. It was a big adjustment just in terms of ministry. First of all, I, again, I grew up in the Midwest, big church. My experience uh, in, in studying to be a pastor was generally with uh, already existing congregations, larger churches. So that was a huge thing, going to uh, a place where we're, th there was no other presence, at least in, in our church body, and we're starting a church, planning a church from scratch. So that was a big adjustment, but it was also just a big adjustment in terms of lifestyle. I mean, I, I, again, I grew up in the, mid, in the Midwest, a smaller town, a town of 18,000 people, Watertown, Wisconsin. And so it, moving from, from a, a town of 18,000 to a city of 27,000 per square mile, <laughs> right? Over 8 million. I think they're at 8.6 now in New York, over 20 in the metro area. And we loved it. It was totally our jam. It was wonderful. But again, a big adjustment. We went from the Midwest where there's, you know, wide open spaces. And I guess you can get out of the city and go to wide open spaces, but, you know, it, you're just kind of, you don't have a car and you're just, gonna, you're just there. So, uh, but anyway, you go from wide open spaces to, to the concrete jungle of New York City with literally over 3,000, 300 rather, skyscrapers. We went from the Midwest from these ginormous grocery stores. You know where, where they have the frozen aisle with like a median? And there's, you know, there's both sides and, and there's pizza as far as the eye can see. You can't even see to these these small grocery stores where you learn really quickly not to grab a cart because you can't pass by someone else with a cart in the same aisle. We went from a house to an apartment. So big adjustment, and that was an adventure. We moved into our, the, the moving truck dropped us off in Jackson Heights, Queens, and not everything fit. Again, house to apartment. So we, I mean, just way too much stuff. It was a two-bedroom place. It wasn't small, but it was, again, by comparison, um, not a lot of storage in, in, the, in, the, in the apartment itself. So we had to get a storage unit. And that was pretty common. There's a whole Long Island city is full of facilities with stories of, of storage units. But a lot of things didn't fit. We had just gotten married a year earlier, so plenty of, of, of wedding gifts that were unboxed remain unboxed. A lot of things that, again, we, we, we brought with us went into storage, and we didn't see them again until we moved out of New York seven years later. We had this big couch. We used to have it here. Some of you might remember a big, oversized blue couch, which we clearly didn't buy in New York City because no one in their right mind would ever buy this couch in New York City. And we couldn't get in the front door. We literally had to go up to, um, we, went, we went up three stairs. Um, you can go back a slide, please. Um, we went up three, three flights or up to the third floor, and then we had to swing it in, but it was so tight up there, we literally couldn't get in the front door. So the couch went in the storage. So, wealth comparison. Speaking of storage units and other wealth comparisons, did you know that 90% of storage units worldwide are in the U.S.? A couple other wealth comparisons. 30% uh, of household wealth is held by Americans here in this country, 30, or worldwide. So 30% is, is held here in this country, 70% the rest of the world. Uh, here in this country, the average American household income is 10 times that of the global average. Now, I don't say these things to make us feel badly. These are blessings, right? Um, God doesn't want us to feel guilty about blessings. And we could go on and on with, with, with comparisons. But my point is this, we are incredibly blessed. And, and praise God for that. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Again, let's not feel guilty about what God has given to us. At the same time, God wants us to keep our priorities straight. 
At the same time, you know, God wants us to have a, a healthy relationship with our material possessions. Here's another, uh, an, another tidbit of information, this time Bible trivia, I guess you might say. Um, which worldly thing did Jesus talk about most? Worldly thing did Jesus talk about most? Uh, you might think, well, due to the context, maybe material possessions. No, the, first, the thing he talked about most, the worldly thing was food, which I appreciate. Um, number two, it's, it's material wealth. It's um, possessions. Uh, in 11 of the 39 parables, Material wealth or, or possessions, money is somehow incorporated. It's not always the main point necessarily, but it's often incorporated into the parable in some way. One out of every seven verses that, Jesus, that is, that is uh, quoted of Jesus speaking in the four Gospels, one out of every seven verses has to do with material possessions or wealth. And again, the, the, for these, the, the parables and those, the one out of seven verses, it, he isn't always just hammering home on wealth or food or whatever it is. There's always a bigger point. He, he talks about material possessions. He talks about wealth because he knows it's a big deal for human beings. And time and time, time again, what he's doing is, is he, he wants us to have that proper, that healthy relationship with material things. He wants us to have that proper perspective. Because the, the reality is, in, in our world, there's a lot of competition. There's a ton of competition for, for our hearts, quite honestly, for our focus in life. So yeah, Jesus talks about it today, and we're going to give some thought to it. Jesus, had, or in, in Luke chapter 12, it starts out, there's someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Again, as I mentioned before when I was reading this, that's, Jesus isn't trying to like, hey, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. But he's like, is that, why you real, is, is that what you want me to do here on this earth? To settle all your disputes? No, he came to be our Savior. He, he came with a much higher purpose. Then he said to them, he said to the crowd, watch out. Be on your, guards against, on your, uh, on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, maybe this seems like an overreaction to you. So the man comes with what might seem like a, a reasonable request to perhaps a common issue. I, 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 I feel like there are similar disputes that happen quite regularly in life. And, and so we, we might look at this and say, all right, you know, Jesus, your God, I'm not. And yet, did we really need to jump into this whole thing when he comes to you with this, th th this request? But, but here's the thing. Jesus, first of all, he's God. He, he, knows, he knows the man's heart, as well as the hearts of, of the, everyone in the crowd. He knew that this was an important issue to, to address. At the same time, it was clearly an issue. I mean, if, if this man and his brother were having some kind of dispute, some kind of conflict, obviously material possessions were, 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 were having a negative impact. Real, not really the possessions, the condition of the heart was having a negative impact on, on a relationship here between two brothers. And so Jesus, again, he gets right to the point. He says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. I mean, all kinds of greed. I mean, greed manifests itself in a lot of different ways, right? I think we know that. And, and perhaps they, they're, they're maybe just slightly, one slightly different from the other, but just to, to help us try to understand how, how greed creeps into our lives so easily, sometimes it looks like a lack of gratitude. Again, despite God's incredible generosity with us. Or, or it looks like discontentment, again, despite God's incredible generosity towards us. Or, or it can look like comparing ourselves to others. I wish I had what they have. I wish I had what he has. I wish I had what she has. Again, that, that's, that falls into lack of contentment, lack of gratitude. But the point here, again, Jesus says, be on your guard I mean, it, against all kinds of greed. Greed manifests itself in many ways. The Apostle Paul calls greed idolatry. You heard that in our second lesson, Colossians 3, 5. It says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil de uh, desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You know, sometimes we talk about idolatry, we, we, we define it as taking a thing, and, and oftentimes uh, I, think of it, I like to think of it this way because this is where it really sneaks up on us, taking a good thing, like material possessions, and turning it into an ultimate thing, which is when our priorities get out of, out of whack. That's really idolatry. It's elevating something to an ultimate thing. First commandment, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other priorities before me. Nothing else should be as important as I am in your life. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's equating, God through Paul, is equating greed with idolatry. Jesus, in our parable, the parable he tells us in, in chapter uh, 12 here from Luke, he also calls greed foolish. Why is greed foolish? I think it's interesting because I feel like we're at a time in our culture where greed is kind of celebrated. You know? Where the reality is Jesus calls it, Jesus calls it foolish. Why is that? Well, again, first of all, these two brothers are in dispute. Greed is foolish because it can drive a wedge between people. And I think we all know that. I think we've all seen that. Maybe we've been a part of that in different relationships in our lives. It can drive a wedge between people. Even in this case, if, if greed continued to... It, let, let's just say... Let's say Jesus said, okay, I will help you settle this. I'm going to come with you. Let's go find your brother. Let's have a conversation. Let's settle this right now. Even if he, if he had done that, and, and if greed were still an issue with one or the both of them, neither one would have been happy. And so even though the matter is settled because of the greed, the wedge is still there. And it's still dividing siblings. So, so greed is foolish, number one, because it can drive a wedge between people. Number two, as Jesus makes the point in, our, in the parable he tells, everything accumulated in life will one day be gone. You know, there's a saying, you can't take it with you, right? There's another exact same point, not as, not as common a phrase. You never see a hearse pulling a trailer, right? Jesus says, Luke chapter 12, verse 20, God said, you know, this is in that parable, the dialogue between the, the guy with an abundant harvest and God God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? If we make material wealth the foundation, the basis for our happiness in life, if we make it the heart and soul of our identity in life and our purpose, Jesus says, watch out. Because number one, it's temporary. Number two, it can't give you what only God himself can give you. That true peace, joy, satisfaction, contentment. It can't give you what only God, God can give you. And let's be honest, it has been the downfall of many, many a person emotionally. Right? People have done drastic things because in their greed, they, they, weren't, they weren't getting what they wanted or they had a, they had a huge fallout in terms of their finances. It, it's been the downfall of people emotionally. It's been the downfall of people relationally. Again, driving a wedge between people. It, it's, it's been the downfall of, of people spiritually because they've elevated it to an ultimate place in their hearts. Life, it, it, Jesus makes this point for us here today that in life, it's not about how much you have. It's not about how much you have or don't have. It's how you view life. Verse 15, again, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Right? And, and just to, to illustrate that, I mean, a, a person with everything can be never content, right? Can be greedy for more. While a person with little to nothing by earthly standards might be more content than the person with, quote-unquote, everything. And so I would encourage you, for the sake of your, your spiritual health, for your relationship with God, ask yourself, what does life consist of for me? What, what, what is it all about? What, what, is, what, what is most important? What, what are the ultimate things 
for me? What, what does life consist of for you? You know, in contrast to the foolishness and downfall of greed, the Lord gives us perspective. He gives us guidance in this area. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. The Apostle Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. He set aside the incomprehensible riches of heaven because it was more important for him to get us to heaven. He, he set aside the, the wealth, the riches of heaven. He became poor, as it says here, so that you and I could have the promise of heaven, so that you and I could, could have this relationship with him, one that gives peace, one that assures us that our, our sins are forgiven, assures us that we have eternal life in heaven. Ephesians 3, verses 17 to 19, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, Paul writes, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled up with that, that you may be filled up to the measure of all the fullness of God. Nothing can fill you up like the love of, Christ in, like the love of God in Christ Jesus and everything that it means as a member of his family of faith, here on earth and for eternal life in heaven. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 33, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow, go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus promises contentment. He promises happiness. He promises satisfaction when our identity is rooted in him. He promises these things when we look to him to be filled up. And then having been reminded of these beautiful truths, that, that this perspective that the Lord, this eternal perspective that the Lord gives us, we can join King David in Psalm 23 where he said, my cup overflows. In other words, count your blessings and, and, and appreciate everything that the Lord has given you. Whether by earthly comparisons, that's a lot. Whether by earthly comparisons, that's a little. You have what the Lord knows you should have and wants you to have. That's what it looks like to be focused on contentment. Taking inventory of and being grateful for what God has given you. Trusting that in the Lord's wisdom and his, according to his promises, he will always give you what you need. In fact, he'll give you everything that he knows that you can handle. I, and, and just thinking this through this, this last week, I thought to myself, what if God gave me everything I ever wanted? Where would that leave me? Would I be in good shape after that? Absolutely not. I know I wouldn't be. And, and, and not that I can, you, you can't make an argument from silence. I can't necessarily prove that other than to say, God always gives us what he knows is best for us. And so if he knew that to give me everything is best for me, he would have done it. So again, we, 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 to, to focus on contentment is to remember that God in his wisdom, he gives us everything that we need, in fact, everything that he knows we are able to handle without losing our perspective on life. To be focused on contentment is to understand then what's most important. Who I am, child of God. What I am, forgiven. Where I'm going, eternal life with him in heaven. Paul writes to the Philippians, he says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. How could Paul say that? How could he write that down in all seriousness? How could he truly believe this? Because his priorities were in the right place. Because his heart was in the right place. Because he let the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding, rule in his heart. You know, another way of just uh, of thinking of this, illustrating this, is um, don't try to fill a God-sized hole with something that only God himself can fill, with his truths and promises. As followers of Christ then, as focused followers of Christ, 
we don't uh, avoid or despise wealth, again, it's a blessing from God. And I want to be very clear about that. Um, at the same time, though, we are grateful for everything that the Lord gives us. James chapter 1, verse 17 reminds us that every good and perfect gift is from God. It's from the Lord. As focused followers of Christ, we understand what earthly wealth can and cannot do. As focused followers of Christ, we use our God-given wealth to honor him. Jesus says in our lesson for today, Luke chapter 12, verse 21, he talks about being rich toward God. What, what, does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? It, it's a number of things. Again, God gives us guidance on this in his word. Um, it, it does look like being generous with offerings. And, and I know that uh, this is an area where sometimes people get uncomfortable. God talks about it. It is a blessing to honor God with our wealth. And one of the ways we do that is by giving back to him generously a portion of what he has generously given to us. So Proverbs 3 verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. When it talks about first fruits in the Old Testament, that is, it was within the context of giving offerings back to God. So the Lord wants us to honor him with our wealth, to be rich toward him in terms of giving back to him, in terms of offer, offering. So we do that generously, where it's, uh, Paul talks about that in Corinthians. We also do it with confidence. Again, trusting that the Lord will always give us what we need. In fact, he gets really direct in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. To be rich toward God, to honor God with our wealth, is, also includes being generous towards others. God wants us to do that. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says, Command those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. How do we honor God with our wealth? What does it look like to be rich toward God? Uh, it, it's, it's an overall, uh, what I guess I would call general kingdom-mindedness, God's kingdom, Great commission, go and make disciples. In other words, how can I use what God has given me for the sake of souls, right? Um, Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, verse 9, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. In other words, leverage what you have for relationships, whether personally or within the context of a church family like this. Leverage what you have for relationships, ultimately with the purpose of winning souls for Christ. Ultimately with the purpose for their eternal future. This is our material possessions, our wealth. This is another aspect of life, contentment, another aspect, another area of, of life that we can seek first God's kingdom, that we can set our hearts on things above. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so, so incredibly blessed. Uh, if, if we start quantifying that and comparing ourselves with others, we get into trouble. Um, we are blessed first and foremost because you are a part of our lives. We are a part of your family. And, and you give us everything that we need. You give us everything that we know, that you know we can handle. Help us to, tr help us to take inventory of what we have to be grateful for that and, and then to trust that you will always take care of us every single step of the way in terms of our material needs for life. And then motivate us by your grace, your mercy, that, that, that Jesus, you were in heaven, you came to this earth, you left the glory of heaven, you came to a sinful earth, you, you, you subjected yourself to, to death and a cross to forgive our sins so that we could be rich beyond comprehension, so that we could have the wealth of heaven. You did that for us. You, let this grace and your mercy towards us motivate us to be rich toward you. We, we have plenty of, of, of financial responsibilities, Lord, and, and, and so we, we, we fulfill those faithfully. At the same time, Lord, you say, honor me with your wealth. Be rich toward you. And, and so motivate us by your grace and mercy to do that, to, to give back to you confidently, to give back to you generously, to be generous with others, and ultimately to use the things that you've given us in life for the sake of souls, 
so that more people may come to know Jesus as their Savior, so that more people may know that, that peace, hope, and joy that only comes from knowing that we have eternal life with you in heaven. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.